we're really excited today to have two uh, top-notch presenters on a subject that is near and dear to everyone's hearts. As you know, um, there's been a lot of information in, in about the economy. Uh, we all know locally uh, how it's hit our particular organizations, um, but uh, where the national economy is, regional economy and the state economy is going is, uh, is, is very important to all of us. Uh, we'd all like to turn back to an economy that is running as strong as it was pre-COVID. And uh, again, we have a couple of gentlemen here to uh, talk about that. Uh, we have John Deskins. John is the, de the Director of the Bureau of Business and Economic Research at WVU, John Chambers College of Business and Economics. He serves as Assistant Dean for Outreach and Engagement as well as being the director of the Bureau of Business and Economic Research, an associate professor of economics in the College of Business and Economics at West Virginia University. He leads the Bureau's um, effort to serve the state by providing rigorous economic analysis and macroeconomic forecasting to business leaders and policy makers across the state. He received his PhD in economics from the University of Tennessee. Also with us today is Mr. Thomas Barkin, president and CEO the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond. He is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Federal Bank. In his role, he is responsible for the monetary policy, bank supervision, payment services, and the Fed's national IT organization. He serves on the Fed's Chief Monetary Policy Body, the Federal Open Market Committee, and he's on the ground continuing, continuing the Fed's Fifth District, which covers South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, DC, West Virginia, in Maryland and has brought real focus to the less prosperous Agreed. parts of the district. Um, Tom is a native of Tampa, Florida and attended the Harvard University where he earned an undergraduate MBA and law degrees. It's great to be with you, uh, at least virtually today, and to be invited into so many of your offices, uh, bedrooms and uh, kitchens. Um, uh, as Russ said, I thought I might just talk about uh, where I think the economy is uh, and where it might be headed. Uh, these are my own thoughts. These aren't official thoughts of the FOMC of the, or the Federal Reserve System, and that frees me up to be as direct as I want and also uh, to answer all of your questions and comments, which I'm very much looking forward to. Uh, before I came to this job, I spent 30 years in business. And so, you know, uh, I'm not a researcher uh, or a PhD, and so I hope you'll find my comments maybe a little different than what you normally hear. Um, let me start by saying we have to be aware of there are two economies uh, here. There's the one we see in the numbers and the one we might see if we weren't in the middle of unprecedented levels of fiscal and monetary stimulus. As you guys well know, the economy we see in the numbers is sobering enough. Unemployment in July was 10.2%. That's basically equivalent to the depths of the Great Recession in 2009. Another way to think about it is that payroll employment is down 13 million since before the virus hit us. Now, that's very different by sector. Leisure and hospitality, of course, has been hit the worst. That's down in the high 20% range. Um, but with the exception of the few industries that serve people sheltering at home, like online or grocery or home and garden, jobs in most sectors are down in the range of five to 10%. And distress, distressing those job losses have disproportionately fallen on people of color, which is a historic fault line, uh, painfully tangible right now. Second quarter GDP was down 33%. That's three times worse than the previous high in the 73 year series. And these numbers were of course driven by the shutdown and its impact. But the economy has been back open for around three months and you can see progress in the real time data that the Richmond Fed tracks, albeit with some slowing in momentum as the virus resurged over the last two months. Card spending has come back close to last year's levels, despite being down in the high 20s in early April. Uh, goods demand is strong, and in many cases, even outpacing supply. But consumer sentiment has taken a step back. We saw some numbers yesterday uh, that confirm this. Um, hours worked by hourly employees has plateaued and even started to decline, as has the number of local businesses open. Job postings have dropped after nearly climbing back to year ago levels and the services sector just broadly uh, remains depressed. But imagine for a second where we'd be without stimulus. Unemployment is 10%, as I said, but personal income, which is wages plus transfer payments, was actually up 4% in June. 
because of the programs enacted to support displaced workers. There's just more money in people's pockets. Um, credit card outstandings are down, which is not what you expect in a downturn. Evictions have been delayed. Personal loans have been given forbearance. I said GDP is down 33%, but small business bankruptcies have been averted by the PPP. You have offices that are empty, but leases are being paid. Movie theaters and cruise lines have been shuttered, but they're still able to get funding. Airlines and agriculture have received subsidies. Net, the fiscal stimulus we've received has been critical in avoiding even worse outcomes. So where do we go from here? Um, the path of the economy, I think, still very much depends on the virus. Um, unfortunately, it hasn't been deterred by warmer weather. Um, we do see, though, growth in new cases and in deaths seem to be moderating in the last couple of weeks. But I think it's still impossible to predict the shape of the curve. Are we going to have future waves of infection that overwhelm the economy? Will we have and be able to distribute a vaccine or an effective treatment? Or will we learn to live with some middle ground where we cope with infection risk with implications, though, for certain businesses like bars and live entertainment? Similarly, it remains a challenge to predict the future path forward on stimulus. So there's a risk we're about to experience the counterfactual I was just talking about. Will the recent executive orders be able to deliver enough support for a long enough time? Will Congress and the White House be able to agree? And if they do, will the money they commit be enough to bridge the economy to the other side of the virus? As you can tell from all these questions, uncertainty is quite high. And I think that's the main point I want to make, which is that uncertainty matters a lot for players in the economy and as a consequence for the economy itself. So let me talk about that a bit. Uh, first of all, uncertainty matters for blue collar workers and those recently out of work. They tend to spend what they make. They've been supported by stimulus and enhanced unemployment. And those funds in turn have supported consumer spending. But if payments lapse, we're likely to see the traditional negative impact that elevated unemployment has on spending, on rent payments, and on loan defaults. And disproportionately, those laid off are young, part time, less educated, and engaged in personal contact roles. Uh, the jobs that they might normally go to next, those alternative jobs, are likely being cut as well. So is it time for them to reinvest in their skills and move into sectors that are hiring, like construction or technology? Or should they wait to see if things will settle back to where they were? Many seem frozen in place by today's uncertainty. Uncertainty also matters for white-collar workers. Many of them have been isolated at home and remain cautious about engaging in commerce. And so as a result, they're spending less. The overall savings rate in the second quarter was 26%. And just to normalize that, normally it would be 7 to 8%. Now that money should be spent at some point, but it will require people to be a lot more certain and confident that they can shop or travel or go to movies or eat out without putting their families at risk. And speaking of families, I think uncertainty matters for working parents and for workers with elderly parents. Believe it or not, I'm talking to a lot of employers who are struggling to find workers, even though unemployment is 10%. Absenteeism is elevated. Now, many complain about enhanced unemployment insurance, but we should also acknowledge the role of uncertainty in disrupting workforce participation among groups that have been trending upward, like prime age women and those 55 and over. Care responsibilities at a time when childcare in schools may or may not be closed and elder care facilities are perceived to be less safe, can make it difficult to commit to work. And perhaps baby boomers are considering leaving the workforce given the increased health risks they perceive. Uncertainty also matters for small businesses. They're still reopening and some are hiring, but for most their PPP money is expired and many are now faced with headcount that is mismatched with current demand. Without further funding, they'll need to resize their organizations. Uncertainty matters for bigger companies too. It makes them hesitant to hire, to invest, and to spend. So does supply chain concerns they face with suppliers who are exposed to COVID. As I talk to the larger companies, I hear them say they don't expect business to return to normal quickly. So many are slimming down as a prudent step to mitigate potential downside risk. And that slimming comes at the expense of employment. In our June CFO survey, most CFOs expected employment to be lower at the end of the year. Some are also delaying budget cycles to try to get more clarity, and that delay could defer investments. Uncertainty matters for banks. Un unlike in the last crisis, they've been critical to supporting the economy in this crisis. 
But with all this uncertainty, how long will they be willing to support credit? We already see in our surveys evidence of tightening standards, which then flow through to the economy. And we're watching loan defaults closely as forbearance periods come to an end. And uncertainty matters for investors, or at least I think it should. Right now we see record treasury issuance, yet yields at all time lows. The stock market is near its all time highs. If negative paths develop though, investors are exposed. So what needs to happen for all this to play out well? Well, you know, I just have to start with public health. We simply need to get this virus under control to give people confidence and certainty. I have to say I'm taken with the example of Germany, which appears to have reopened its economy while adhering to a set of standard practices which, could keep, which should keep the reinfection rate under control. Of course, that requires consistent compliance. It also includes consistent fiscal support. I'm sorry, continued fiscal support. Otherwise, the unemployed, their landlords, and the places they shop are going to feel the full brunt of their situation. Small businesses will be forced to reckon with reduced demand. Local governments and lenders will cut back. And industries under stress will undergo significant restructuring. And I think we need to tackle the longer-term labor market challenges as well. And I'm sure your partnership is thinking about these. We need schools and childcare functioning to get parents back to work. Where we leverage online learning, we need affordable access to broadband so that all have the opportunity to learn. And those displaced by the virus need support to transition to their next career, such as allowing the use of Pell Grants for certificate programs. Now, I've talked a lot about fiscal policy, but I am a central banker, so let me share some thoughts on monetary policy as well. As you know, the Fed is doing a lot to support the economy right now, and we're committed to continuing that support. As the chair said recently, we're not even thinking about thinking about raising rates right now. And markets understand that and have taken our forward guidance to heart. The yield curve today is as flat as it's ever been. Market forecasters don't believe we'll raise rates for years. And this forward guidance was reinforced at our June meeting. Only two of 17 members predicted a rate increase before the end of 2022 in the economic projections that we compile. We'll be redoing those forecasts in September, and it'll be interesting to see them once we add 2023 to the horizon. Zero is the right place to be at present. We're a long way from maximum employment. We ought to be pulling out the stops. But at some point, I hope, we'll be on the other side. And zero isn't costless, as it can encourage leverage and reach for yield behaviors, which in turn drive market volatility and can damage the financial system. Getting to the other side requires, as we've said in our statement, weathering the virus. It also requires, as I've said today, addressing the highly elevated levels of uncertainty all the players in the economy face right now. With that, let me turn it over to John. Thank you so much, President Barkin. And thank you for having me, Russ. I'm really happy to be here to visit with you folks. And I'm happy to see a lot of, uh, you know, fun, familiar faces on the call that I haven't, you know, unfortunately seen in person in a while. Um, I'll just start off by echoing the exact same thing that President Barkin just said. I mean, the uh, level of economic uncertainty that we've seen over the past several months has been just truly unimaginable. This is the highest level of economic uncertainty that we've seen probably since the Great Depression. And, uh, you know, you should keep that in mind whenever you listen to any forecast that I put forward uh, that we are in tremendous economic uncertainty. Um, I am going to share with you my screen and show you just a few figures that characterize the state's economy. Somebody just give me a quick nod. Can you see my figures there? Okay, thank you, Russ, for confirming that. Um, here's the headline number. I'll just give you a second to look at that. It's pretty dramatic. Uh, the state lost overall 94,000 jobs uh, during the worst of this crisis. Between the middle of February to the middle of April, West Virginia lost 94,000 jobs. That represents 13% loss in employment over the course of two months. Uh, and that took us back to a level, of un a level of employment that we saw back in around 1992. It was, a, it was a truly an unimaginable blow, something that I certainly wasn't expecting you know, in February. Uh, but look at the bounce back we've seen. Uh, if you look back to, to, the, to the trough there from mid-April through mid-July, the state has now added back about 50,000 jobs. So we were down 40,000. 
I'm sorry about that. We were down 94,000. We've added back 50,000 so far. So we're already halfway back uh, to, to where we started out. Uh, however, I will say that most of the growth that we've seen was over the course of May and June. July was a slower month. President Barkin mentioned that uh, nationally, and that was true for West Virginia as well. July was slow, uh, and we're eagerly anticipating uh, what August will look like. Um, this figure shows you uh, the employment loss that we saw, 13% for West Virginia, as you see there, as I just mentioned. Um, as crazy as it is to imagine 13% loss in two months. Um, that wasn't as bad as what we saw nationally. The job loss nationally was 14%, uh, and it was even worse in many of our neighboring states, Ohio, Kentucky, Pennsylvania. So, you know, I never ever in my career thought that I would be saying this, but uh, we lost 13% of our jobs in two months, but it could have been worse, and it was worse in many other places. Uh, and the 8% bounce back that we've seen, right? I talked about 50,000 jobs have been added back so far. That's an 8% bounce back. Uh, and the 8% is, is pretty good as well in comparison to the nation and in comparison to neighboring states. Uh, this figure shows you, uh, the blue bars show you the losses uh, by sector from mid-February to mid-April. Then the yellow bars show you the gains by sector over the recovery period. Uh, you see losses were, of course, unsurprisingly worst uh, in leisure and hospitality. 39,000 jobs lost in West Virginia in that sector uh, during that period of overall job loss. Uh, retail tr trade, the trade sector, was, uh, was the second hardest hit. So, of course, retail falls into that category. Uh, and, and health actually was very hard hit. Health was the third hardest hit sector in West Virginia, and that seems odd because some parts of health were booming, but you have to remember that all the selective stuff was, was offline during the shutdown. Your, your visit to your eye doctor, your visit to your dentist, your visit for, for an elective procedure, all that was shut down. So health was actually the third hardest hit sector, uh, but every single sector in West Virginia lost jobs, uh, and you can see that virtually every single sector has gained jobs back during this recovery period. Uh, just, just to give you some more statistics to show you where we are, um, this figure shows you the measured unemployment rate that we have in West Virginia. If you look back to you know, the beginning, if you look back to February, West Virginia came in at an unemployment rate of 4.9%, which was a good unemployment rate. 4.9% is, is low, and we're, you know, we're relatively happy with that. But the figure jumped up to 16%, uh, and since... Uh, the, the, the April reading, we have improved back uh, to 9.9%, just under 10%. So um, from 5% up to 16 and back to 10. So uh, if you just look at this in terms of percentage points, we've already kind of halfway recovered, a little bit more than halfway recovered in terms of the measured unemployment rate. Um, and I will say that, you know, we've seen unemployment this high before. I mean, uh, this is higher than what we saw during the Great Recession in 08, 09. Uh, this is higher than what we saw in the early 2000s recession or the early 1990s recession, of course. But if you go back to the 1980s, uh, West Virginia suffered greatly in the early 80s in 81 or 82. And our unemployment rate was actually higher than 16% then. So we've seen unemployment this high before, but the speed of the decline is truly and completely unprecedented in every way. Right in every other recession that we've seen, there's been some buildup, some you know, some buildup to 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 reach these highs in terms of unemployment. But this happened from one month to the next. I mean, never have we seen anything like that in terms of going from five to sixteen percent unemployment virtually overnight. Um, this figure is similar to what I showed you before. Uh, so in West Virginia, we saw an eleven percentage point rise in unemployment. You see that there in the blue bar, kind of in the middle. Um, and similar to the patterns that I showed you before with regards to employment, uh, our jump in unemployment was slightly better, uh, you know, slightly less severe than what we saw nationally. And it was less severe than what we saw in the neighboring states, Pennsylvania and Kentucky. So again, to, to reiterate that theme, this was uh, unbelievably bad, but it could have been worse. Uh, here's the unemployment insurance number for West Virginia. 
Uh, if you look at the number of continuing unemployment insurance claims in our state, we came in a little bit below 20,000. Uh, if you go back to February or the 1st of March, uh, the figure jumped from 20,000 up to 146,000 virtually overnight, as you see there. And now the figure has improved back to about 54,000. So, uh, so right now we are much less than half of the peak. So we've, you know, you know, glass half full, we have uh, improved dramatically since that peak, uh, but glass half empty, we are still almost three times as high in terms of comp continuing unemployment insurance claims compared to, you know, compared to air norm uh, that we last saw back in February or thereabouts. Uh, you know, I never give a, goodness sakes, I never give a talk in West Virginia without talking about coal. Uh, coal production has suffered a lot as a result of this. Uh, we're not using as much electricity. And of course, the coal that we, uh, you know, use and export for metallurgical purposes, met coal for steel production, met coal has been hit hard as well because of uh, factory shutdowns domestically and globally. Overall, coal production is down about 30% so far from January 1st. Uh, so that's kind of the basic, um, basic headline numbers of where we are in West Virginia. Uh, we suffered incredibly, but we have kind of made a lot of progress. Frankly, uh, the 50,000 jobs we've added back so far, that's probably more than I would have thought when, when we were all so pessimistic back around, you know, April 15th or whenever. So I don't have a forecast for you yet. We will be releasing our economic forecast around the first of the middle part of October. Uh, and when we release a full economic forecast, we'll give you a lot of detail in terms of uh, where we think the economy is headed. Um, I will tell you this though, it, it's, it's, a, it's a hard time to be doing economic forecasting. You know, it, it, it's always hard time to be doing economic forecasting. Of course, you guys know that really lame joke that I've told before. You may have heard me tell it before, but the lame joke is, uh, you know, why did God create weather forecasters? Uh, and the answer is God created weather forecasters to make economists look good. Uh, or, uh, no, I, I, I bungled that. I am, I am so embarrassed. Why did God make economic forecasters? The answer is to make weather forecasters look good. Does that make sense? Right, air forecasts are so bad that it, wakes, it, makes, the, it makes the weatherman look good. Anyway. Let me get on track here again. It's always a hard time to be doing economic forecasting because the economy is so large, so multifaceted, so complicated. But this is especially difficult because, because for this reason. You know, most recessions have a cause in some economic problems, right? Some problems emerge in our economy. We, you know, study those problems, we understand those problems, we, uh, you know, we think about those problems in the context of uh, economic recoveries over time, and we make our forecasts. But this is truly an unprecedented situation because, because the problem here isn't in economics. The problem here is related to a virus that's came completely out of left field. Uh, it, it's not like there's an economic problem that was simmering, right? I mean, if you go back to the first of January, our economy was doing well by all uh, you know, big picture measures that characterize the economy. We were doing fine. Unemployment was incredibly low, for example. The problem here is not with the economics. The problem is with the virus. So it's very hard to make an economic forecast in that context. Anyway, uh, here are some potential paths for recovery. Uh, the most optimistic path is a V-shaped recovery, right? We make a quick decline and we make a quick recovery. So the optimists out there are still hoping for a V-shaped recovery. Um, as it stands right now, I personally remain, you know, fairly optimistic that we'll be able to make a V-shaped recovery because, uh, you know, because of the progress that we've seen so far and because of the fact that we just haven't seen that many uh, signs of underlying long-lasting permanent damage emerge yet. Now, as President Barkin said, we don't know if you know, uh, that's largely due to the federal stimulus and the federal support that has been provided. Uh, but regardless of the cause, so far we haven't seen that many signs of permanent long lasting damage to the economy. So we still remain optimistic. Um, but again, it, this depends on the path of the virus. Uh, if we see another huge outbreak emerge this fall or next winter or whenever, uh, and if we have to shut down again, 
then we could go into what we call a, a W-shaped recovery, where we improve a little bit and we fall right back down to where we were at the beginning or, or at the worst. Um, so there is still potential for a W-shaped recovery, but that's entirely dependent on what the virus does. And I don't know what the virus is going to do. Um, some of the most pessimistic, some of the most pessimistic of us were talking about an L-shaped recovery where we fall down and where we just keep going horizontally with, with really no recovery at all. Uh, I think the 50,000 jobs that we've added back in West Virginia have already proven the pessimists who were calling for an L-shaped recovery wrong. I think we've already kind of outperformed an L-shaped recovery. Uh, and then the last option here is kind of a Nike swoosh shaped recovery. We could call it a check mark shaped recovery, but the cool term in the news over the past few months has been a Nike swoosh. Nike swoosh is a more, is kind of a gradual decline and then a longer, more drawn out recovery. Uh, that's still a possibility, but so far I think the data uh, are giving me optimism for a quicker, more V-shaped recovery. Uh, so those are my comments. Look forward to questions that you have. Obviously, as the you know the economic developer and the chamber guy for our community, everybody's always asking me about a lot of the questions that you just answered. And the true answer is, we know what the indicators say, but we don't really know, right? Uh, because of the uniqueness of of this situation. But one of the things that I have experienced is that our capital mark, our capital projects, where you have to go out and borrow large sums of money you know, invest, build facilities and, and, and prep facilities and so on and so forth has not slowed down at all. So, you know, looking out, you know, two, three years, that's really where those projects start impacting, you know, the economy. Uh, I was just curious, your take on, is it because the interest rate's zero and they're low and the optimism's still there? Or why would the capital type projects still be moving forward relatively strongly? Well, I'll try that on a national um, basis, and maybe John has a more local perspective. I'd say, um, you know, overall capital uh, spending has taken a drop uh, in the last four or five months, um, you know, nationally. So that's absolutely been the case. I will say, though, when I talk to folks who are uh, in construction, they started this whole thing with a pretty sizable backlog. And so it's not if you're if you've got big construction projects you don't just stop them in the middle i think those things have got a lot of money already spent and you take them to fruition and so i don't think that that sector has uh, taken nearly the hit that other sectors have to date and you know we'll see what happens the folks i talked to suggest their backlog is shrinking but it's not yet down to zero and so i think there's still some to come we got a durable goods report this morning that was actually pretty positive and so it's possible that you know, having now been to the bottom, people are looking forward and investing. But I, I wouldn't say the numbers would suggest there's been no drop in uh, capital spending. I don't have much to add. I'll just support President Barkin's comment uh, and, and just say the uncertainty that we face has to be hurting capital spending. Uh, there's, there's no way that this level of uncertainty will not damage long-term investment to some extent. And I think President Barkin's comment about backlogs is, is very legitimate. And of course, low interest rates uh, can't hurt either. Okay, thank you. Um, also, I'm not seeing the chat board light up. So I'll ask another question. Um, stock market, right? So you, you look at the market, and it, it took a drop of what, a 1000 points mm -hmm. or so. And, and now we're back, uh, you know, to uh, pre COVID levels. Um, what is the stock market reacting to, and does that factor at all into into your you know true economic planning and 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 definition of what's happening? I'd just say you ought to ask some experts on the stock market what's happening. I wouldn't presume to to answer your question. I mean, there are a couple things that are pretty obvious. One is um, the major tech firms, um, you know, Amazon, Facebook, uh, Google. They have done very well in this downturn and they have an increasingly disproportionate share of the market cap in the stock market. And so when you look at the stock market, you're looking now more and more at how are the high tech firms doing and they seem to be doing well. Uh, the second thing, which is uh, totally understandable is when we took rates to zero, um, there was some rotation of funds from bonds to stocks. 
Um, and so you've got future income streams with a lower discount rate. And I think that also uh, supports the stock market. That's a feature, not a bug. I mean, I think it's you know quite clear that one of the effects of taking rates to zero, as you were saying a second ago, was it should you know make borrowing, whether that be mortgages or capital expenditure projects, lower. The second thing is it does um, support markets. So when you support markets, you know that then puts money in people's uh, wealth, and that money eventually gets spent. And so those are all things that are pretty uh, understandable. But um, you know, on top of that, as I was suggesting um, in my talk, there clearly is some risk. Uh, you know, as as uh, valuations get elevated. I would say the same thing. Ask somebody who really knows about the stock market. Don't ask me. If I really knew the stock market, I would be rich and I'd be sitting on the beach in the Bahamas right now. Okay. Um, but you might not be because the Bahamas may not allow you to travel there. <laughs> <right>. <laughs> well, um, but I, I think every point that President Barkin made is, of course, legitimate. And I don't claim to know all the potential drivers of the stock market. But I, I do think, you know, people are optimistic. Uh, people who are making the market for, for stock prices are optimistic that a virus, uh, you know, a vaccine will be found, will be discovered, will be made available in the reasonable near future. Uh, so that's a cool thing. And I think they're also, you know, like I said before, they're seeing kind of a dearth of uh, signs of permanent underlying damage. Uh, and so that's helping promote optimism as well. Sure. Yeah. If anybody could predict the stock market, I'd like to meet them, right? Uh, okay. Thank you very much. I'm, I actually got a couple of questions on the chat board. Um, and I'm going to just read this. Uh, if COVID spikes and the students coming back today in K through 12, moving back into school and buildings and, and the governor shuts down businesses again, you know, you're having a lot of governors dealing with these spikes um, and closures have been uh, at least uh, what's happened here. Uh, will we recover back to where we were when, it, uh, when this all started? This includes hospitals emptying out their beds, stopping elective cases again in order to prepare for COVID admissions. And obviously it's the worst case scenario, but if it happens, is there a possibility of fully recovering? And if so, how long would it take? Well, that looks a lot like John's W scenario uh, to me. So, um, you know, I, as I think about scenarios, I, I, uh, I start with a center scenario, which says we've kind of figured out how to deal with this virus you can re-engage in commerce. You probably don't go to bars or concerts. Uh, you probably wear a mask. You keep some distance. And I think if you do that, you know, infections don't go away, but you sort of muddle along uh, in that scenario. There's clearly an upside scenario there, which is we have a vaccine or a treatment, which means people no longer feel nervous about engaging in commerce. And I think there's clearly a downside scenario, which is that uh, reinfection rages and um, and maybe states close down, but I don't think you would need states to close things down to have the downside scenario. I think consumers would close things down. And, you know, I think we saw the start of that this summer when you saw infection rates in places like Texas and Florida escalate. I think you saw consumers in those states take a step back from commerce. And so um, I think if we have a, you know, reinfection process like the one that was described in the question, I don't think that supports a full recovery. I think we're going to need to get to the other side of the virus to have a full recovery. I just will say that, again, our economic forecasting is based on the trajectory that we're on now with regards to virus recovery. We have no ability to, to predict a second wave of the virus. And if that happens, it's just going to throw us for another loop. We cannot predict that. But I will say, uh, just to add to President Barkin's comment, you know, federal support has been important in minimizing the damage that we've seen so far. And our ability to continue this federal support diminishes over time. Um, so if there's a second shutdown, if it is a W-shaped recovery, then, then the second reemergence, the second part of that recovery may very well be more difficult just simply because of their uh, lessening ability to support. Here's just a quick, quick comment. Uh, you know, the federal support, in, in my opinion, for the most part, has been appropriate during the past six months or so. Not that every detail or thing has been appropriate, but I think the overall picture has been appropriate. Uh, but of course, it's driven up the national debt. Uh, so if you look back to the federal debt held by the public as a share of GDP, 
you go back to 2007, that figure was somewhere around 35 or 40%. And it had been in that 35 or 40% range for a long time. But when we provided a large stimulus in 08, 09, federal debt, federal debt held by the public as a share of GDP, the statistic rose from about 35 or 40%, rose up to about 70%. Now the figure has risen to about 100%. Uh, so federal debt held uh, by the public as a share of total GDP is nearly equal to GDP. Um, and so that's just an indicator that, you know, we can't keep providing stimulus like this forever and forever and forever. Um, and again, the further this goes on, uh, the longer this goes on, the more difficult it will be for us to provide that support. Tom, you have anything in regards to... Uh I think those numbers are totally right. I just remind you that uh, the last time and the only time we were at 100% was after World War II. So that, that's where we've gotten. I, I do think there's a big difference between short term and medium to long term when it comes to fiscal debt. I mean, and, uh, and I, I, I try to hold those two thoughts in my mind at the same time. Uh, it does feel to me that there's uh, an imperative to get us to the other side of this crisis that will require stimulus of the kind that we've had and perhaps uh, even more. On the back end of it though, we're gonna have to get our fiscal house in order. And you know, the part that worries me the most about the numbers that John talked about was you know, the increases that we saw during the times when unemployment was very low. Those are usually the times that you stock yourself up for the next downturn. And we were running a, a trillion dollar deficit uh, in 2019. And so, you know, I think on the back end of this, we're going to have to do it. And that's going to be some combination of um, uh, revenues, reducing costs, and of course, increasing growth. And I think that's going to be a tough thing for us to get our heads around, but, uh, but it's important. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, a couple other questions. Um, so one is, what is the relationship between the impact of COVID and new construction? Are you, are you able to to see a, a direct uh, a correlation between the two? Uh, let's see. Well, well first of all, um, you know, when states closed down uh, uh, businesses in late March and April into early May, um, you definitely saw that impact in construction in a number of states. Pennsylvania would be one, for example, where um, they, they took construction and, and sort of shut it down completely. So first and foremost, I think when you have government shutdowns, COVID, you know, will affect new construction. Um, similarly, uh, for a couple of months, you couldn't really sell houses because people didn't want to let people in their houses. And uh, the, you know, video tour of a house hadn't yet reached, uh, I'd say, maturity. I'd say post that time, you know, uh, we're seeing very big differences in construction based on where you sit. Residential construction is actually quite strong uh, right now. Uh, there's pent up demand uh, for houses, maybe you've got people moving from bigger cities to smaller towns or the suburbs. Um, by the way, if you're in your house for a significant period of time, like many of us are, and you don't like your office or you don't like your kitchen and you don't have enough room for your entire family, I think it, it does create some focus on what am I going to do to improve my housing situation, particularly those with more money uh, in their pockets. Interest rates are very low, which also uh, helps. So on the residential construction side, I think we're seeing a boom. Um, on the commercial construction side, like I said, it's a little different. I think um, there's a lot of backlogs that are being worked down. I think new construction starts on the commercial side uh, seem to me to be limited. Um, in particular, the institutional side of it, states and local governments are tight on money. You know, many are making choices not to start new things. Um, certainly new retail projects you're seeing less of where you're seeing more activities on the industrial uh, side, and in particular warehouses, distribution centers, those kinds of things. I just will add really quickly, if you remember my slides that I showed a second ago, I showed the job losses by sector over the decline period, and then the gains by sector since mid-April, since we've been in a, re in a recovery period. I just will say for construction, the sector actually has fully recovered in West Virginia. I, I, I didn't do a complete tally, mm -hmm but it may be the only sector that has truly fully recovered in the state uh, over the course of this year. So that's, uh, that's a cool thing. I, I just will say this is not interesting or relevant, but uh, I didn't notice this when I was gone nine hours a day, 
But since I've been home about May or June, I noticed that my paint and my carpet on my main floor in my house was awful. So I've done a bunch of home renovations over the last month simply because I didn't notice how bad the carpet was when I wasn't home 24 seven. So if you look at Lowe's and Home Depot, just as good examples of that, I mean, uh, John's not alone. I mean, that is true. Anyone who was sitting at home maybe had a little extra money in their pocket because they weren't taking a trip or weren't going to a restaurant. They bought patio furniture. They redid their decks. They changed their carpets, their paint, their cabinets. Anyone who sells into those sectors has done extremely well. Uh, yeah, uh, me included. Um, but also, you know, you mentioned interest rates, uh, Tom, and you'd indicated like looking to see what the, when you add 2023 into the mix, but um, I have a question about, you know, the judging on historic instances of lowering interest rates to stimulate the market. How long do you anticipate uh, them staying down to encourage consumer spending? Well, uh, first of all, I think of lowering interest rates, not the goal isn't to stimulate the markets. The goal is to stimulate the economy, right? You make uh, mortgage rates lower so people can you know, buy a house or refinance their mortgage. You make auto rates lower so people can uh, buy a car. You make uh, uh, debt burdens you know, more handleable for people who've got debt. That's, that's the primary transmission mechanism. I'd say the markets is a, a secondary. And um, you know, our mandate is uh, maximum employment and stable prices. We've defined stable prices as 2% inflation. You know, right now, um, uh, unemployment's, like I said, around 10%. Uh, we had it down to 3.5% before um, COVID hit. Uh, right now, inflation is about 1.4%. Uh, so when you've got unemployment massively higher than your goal and inflation somewhat lower than your goal, it's pretty easy to say we're going to keep it at zero for some time. Uh, I think the phrase we've used is till we've weathered the vi virus and we're on track to achieve our mandate. Well, we clearly haven't weathered the virus yet. And, you know, given the numbers I just told you, we're clearly not yet close to our mandate. So I think uh, you keep it low until the conditions you put in place are, are, uh, are met, which I project will still be some time. Okay, so, all right, you know, now you're a Federal Reserve and we have John's economist looking at the state. Um, as a local community, um, you know, what would be your advice, to what, what we should be doing uh, now in preparation to, to help our local economy improve uh, coming out of, uh, of, of, of the COVID-19 pandemic? Just, you don't know the community, Tom, for example, but like, what would you tell, what are things that we need to be watching uh, and doing uh, to be better at coming out than, than other folks? Well, and I've, I've been in the community, so I, I do know it a bit. I, but I, so I said the virus is all important here. And so I do think that's true in your world. But I'd, what I'd say is um, people need to understand clearly with confidence what it is they need to do to both stay personally stay personally healthy and their families healthy while also engaging in commerce. And so I've seen a number of different uh, business organizations do some things to just get clear for people that this is safe and this isn't safe. The example I give is, you know, food inspection. Um, you go to a restaurant and you don't feel like you're putting your health at risk because somebody inspects the food. In Richmond, for example, they had a chamber organization put little signs on the door saying, these guys are operating with proper protocols. And I think that's a, that, you know, helping people engage in commerce while feeling safe, that's a place that local business organizations, I think, can really make a mark. Um, so that's number one. Number two is, as I'm suggesting, to get the economy working, we need people working. And to have people working, you need to have childcare that works. You need to have schools operating so people can, um, you know, uh, have the time to get back to the kids. You need nursing homes operating so people with elderly parents. And so there's a piece to this, which is supporting the efforts being made, you know, to, to get schools and childcare <coughs> uh, operating. Then there's a third piece, which is the people who've surplused, as John said, are disproportionately in leisure and hospitality. And so this question of how we help those people in those industries find their next job. And, um, you know, uh, there are a lot of people, strangely, 
who can't find employees right now. They're in manufacturing, they're in construction, they're in technology. Um, and so I, I think there's got to be something about retraining, redeployment to help those people who are interested uh, into their next job. And then I'll just say the obvious, which is if you could make sure that the uh, people of West Virginia try to stay out of parties, that would be a, a final thing. I think they would keep the university operating uh, in a healthy fashion. And that's so important, obviously, to your economy. I'll just say first and foremost, uh, most of you or all of you have heard me preach for quite some time about the desperate need that we have to improve human capital outcomes in West Virginia for a long time. Um, and I, I'll just say, let's not forget about those long-term challenges because once we get through this, uh, we're still going to need to be as diligent as ever uh, on improving education, health, and drug abuse outcomes in West Virginia. Those haven't gone anywhere. Um, but the one additional piece that I'll throw out is this. Now, this is something I've been talking about quite a bit over the past few months and something that I've kind of gotten excited about. Uh, it's the idea that, you know, a lot of people are working remotely now. And in many cases, people are finding that remote work is just fine. And we believe that a lot of businesses are going to move to remote work permanently after this crisis because we've kind of been thrown into the deep end and we figured out which jobs are fine remotely and which jobs aren't. So we're going to have an increase in remote workers nationally. And this was already happening even before this crisis. Um, but here we are in West Virginia. We have great scenery. I'm sitting here looking at my window right here, looking at these beautiful trees. Um, we are, you know, relatively rural. We're away from the real hot spots where the virus was in the big cities like New York. Um, Anyway, the point is we have an entirely new economic development strategy before us, right? For the entire history of economic development, our focus has been on attracting a big business to the state to bring the jobs with it. But now we have a whole new approach, you know, an additional approach where we can, you know, look at these remote workers, these people who are now work, working remotely across the country and we can say, hey, come to West Virginia, we didn't suffer as much during this pandemic because the virus wasn't as widespread. We don't think we will suffer as much during the next pandemic. At the same time, we have some real strengths to sell. We have tremendous, unbelievable outdoor opportunities and things like whitewater rafting, rock climbing, mountain biking, as far as Eastern United States goes. Uh, so we think we have a real potential to attract some of these remote workers to West Virginia. Um, it's the same kind of idea of economic development, but instead of act, instead of attracting one company to, to provide 500 jobs, we're talking about attracting just 500 individual remote workers. And I've heard several anecdotal accounts pop up already of, of kind of, you know, new remote workers who, who are moving to West Virginia um, to, to be able to enjoy the amenities that we have here, to be able to enjoy the low cost of living. Um, but you know, still work their job in Washington or Chicago or New York or wherever. So I, the, kind of the advice that I've been giving is we should do everything that we can to understand how we can sell West Virginia as a great place of li as a great place to live to remote workers. And two things just on that, you know, one is uh, it requires technological enablement, mm -hmm. right? If you can't, you know, go to school or do your job online um, at scale, then you can't make that story work. And the second is, I, I think uh, John's onto something magical, but the marketing is really important to that because, um, you know, all of a sudden now you're in a nationwide competition for a place for people to live and work remotely. So you're competing with Boulder, you know, just to pick another sort of hot city in a university uh, town. Well, what is your story going to be versus theirs? And I think there's a great set of stories that include cost of living and a bunch of other pieces, but it really does mean we've got to up the marketing game to win that particular fight. Great points. And, and then just so you all know, I mean, we're, uh, we're efforting in that, that arena. So, so uh, WVU uh, having that as a heck of an asset, obviously. Um, when you look at the recreational opportunities that just exist in, in within a 15, 20 mile radius of this community, we, we compete very well with uh, any other place you could pick off the top of your head uh, in those categories. So I think you're going to see a much stronger effort in, uh, in that, on that front and, and a better job of marketing. You know, uh, we're wild and wonderful. Um, 
we, we use that phrase for a long, long time, but what does that mean? That means we do have some of those, those key components that um, many, many people are looking for and COVID's only enhanced that, that move. So it's kind of interesting, right? You have reshoring, right? It, reshoring has been happening for a while and I think this is probably stepping it up a little bit uh, from companies coming in, but we're all gonna, so gonna see an adjustment and correct me if I'm wrong, of, of people looking for alternative places to go, right? It's the mid-sized markets that are growing in population more so than the big ones. Is, and, and we hope to be uh, a part of that. Um, so we have about three minutes left for our presentation. The, the last question is pretty appropriate because we are in Morgantown. We are the home of WVU. Um, sports uh, are a big thing. And uh, we're fortunate the Big 12 decided they're going to try to play football. Uh, but we're not sure how many people are going to be able to sit in the stands and watch them. Um, but the question here is, what economic impact will the state of West Virginia feel if WVU football and basketball home games are not allowed fans to attend? I may take that one, President Barkin, since that's a more <laughs> local topic here. Um, yeah, and there's no doubt that there will be an economic impact. In my office, we have actually kind of looked carefully at, at, the, at the economic impact before, but we haven't done that in the past decade or so, so I don't have fresh numbers for you. Uh, but there's no doubt that people come in to watch those games from out of state, uh, and they bring in money, and they spend that money at hotels and restaurants and bars and all this other stuff here in the uh, north central West Virginia. And we'll miss that, right? I mean, if, if those people don't come in and spend their money, if the football season is canceled, then it's going to be a hit. I don't have an exact number for you, but certainly we welcome that visitor spending. We want those visitors to come in and, um, and of course, go home sad because they got beat, but we still want them to come in and spend their money. Um, and, and just a quick aside, you know, WVU football is such a huge, huge part of our culture and just the spirit on campus in the fall. And I personally will be very sad if it doesn't happen, not strictly from an economic perspective, but just from the perspective of we'll miss out on that, you know, key, uh, you know, piece of our culture that ties us all together and brings us together as mountaineers in the fall. So I hope we're able to make it work. Um, this is a real issue across a bunch of uh, businesses because this is money that, you know, people earmark and spend, and it obviously supports a bunch of Morgantown uh, businesses. Um, I think it is an interesting question. Well, if, if for, you know, uh, uh, if unfortunately attendance is limited or doesn't happen, where do those people, where are they going to spend that money? And I do think, you know, back to John's house and Russ, your house, I think people have chosen to take their vacation money and spend it on their homes. So I don't know where people are going to spend their football money. Uh, I think they'll spend it on something. And I think maybe that's part of the, if you do go that way, maybe we just need to sell a lot of extra merchandise. <laughs> it's not hard to sell WVU merchandise around here. That's for sure. So um, well, that uh, wraps up the questions on the chat uh, board. And um, is there any final comments either uh, Tom or John would like to make uh, wrap us up here? I appreciate seeing all of you uh, and uh, virtually, and I'm looking forward. I'm in West Virginia all next week, and so looking forward to being on the ground. Yeah, same here. Just happy to be here and happy to visit with all you folks. Well, we certainly appreciate uh, you sharing time with us today. It's been very informative, and and, uh, and it's particularly with the bottom line statement is um, this is a pandemic-related economic situation, and the best way to fix that is to get healthy. Uh, and, and we're, we're promoting that as well and trying to find ways to open responsibly. And we must all keep that first and foremost before there is more long-term damage done. Is that a fair statement? Very so, true. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you so much. Everybody have a great day and I appreciate everyone in attendance here at today's uh, virtual uh, meeting. So.